Hey guys, Courtney here. Just wanted to jump in before I get to the content and let you guys know that I have a special webinar coming up on Saturday, November 5th, and it is about Mars reclaiming the warrior within. So this one is going to be maybe a workshop webinar style type of thing. So bring your charts ready. If you have questions, of course, come prepare with those. But we're going to be taking a deep dive into looking at Mars and how it will develop in our childhood and basically how we can kind of take back where we may have been suppressed in some ways in regards to our autonomy, our will, our anger, our assertiveness, our ambition, our masculinity, our entrepreneurial self, our physical self. Those are all aspects of Mars that can be either underdeveloped or suppressed or really supported in our charts. And if you wanna learn about the side of yourself and learn how to bring it into balance, then definitely check this one out. It's very near and dear to my heart. So I hope to see you there. The link for that is down below and I hope you guys have a great day. Hey guys, this is Courtney from Lil's Bloom and today we're going to be talking about anxiety and mental health signatures in astrology. So definitely a quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor. I'm not even a medical astrologer. I'm not giving any medical advice. I'm not diagnosing anyone or anything. Always talk to your doctor. This is never a replacement for anything to do with medicine and a doctor. <laughs> um, I'm just simply a student of astrology who has noticed patterns when looking at people's charts of when they tend to feel like they may respond to stress with maybe more anxiety than other people or they may have larger mood swings. So there are certain mental maladies that I see signatures for in the chart that I'm not diagnosing. This is of particular interest of me because of my chart has a lot, a lot of, a lot of these signatures. So I experience quite a bit of anxiety myself. And um, also I have um, a father who passed away due to suicide and he definitely had some of these signatures himself. So it definitely interests me. I think it's important to talk about with clients, but to also never define a client with an anxiety disorder um, because again, we do not diagnose and I also don't like labeling and claiming certain things. Um, I think it's fine to say you experience something, um, but I don't like when people say I am something. So I am anxious is something I would never recommend saying because it will, I think, solidify that more so in your mind and closely identify as that. So all of these are disclaimers before we get started. Okay, so my personal story, as I mentioned, um, I definitely have experienced quite a bit of anxiety. I actually didn't even realize that I was experiencing anxiety until I went off to college and I lived with a bunch of girls in a dorm and I saw that everyone else was so much calmer than me <laughs> and that no one else kind of had this very internally chaotic energy. Obviously I couldn't tell, but they didn't have like the same type of energy that I had. and. I could also recognize that, you know, my family growing up also really experienced anxiety. And so I was just normal. That was a normal environment for me. I it normalized it. I didn't recognize that it was anything unusual until I started living with people who didn't have it. And then, as I mentioned, my father passed away from suicide and um, addiction issues and all of the above. And I definitely think that a large part about this was you know, issues around anxiety and depression, mental health and feeling, you know, mentally unstable. And so it has become something that is very important to me and um, understanding this and how to best work with this in my own life. And I've done so much to overcome, you know, certain anxiety that I've experienced and I still experience it because it is definitely something that is kind of a... It, it is kind of my natural thing that I'll slip into, basically. It's a predisposition and I use certain coping tools to then overcome it 
and um, not experience the worst of it. And so I'm going to actually give some tools that I've used and that are recommended for certain um, signatures and charts. Okay, so what constructs our mind in astrology? I'm sure you guys have all heard of Mercury. Obviously, Mercury is a huge part of what makes up the quality of your mind, the functioning of your mind, but as well as the mood, the moon, because the moon is representing our emotional well-being, um, our approach to our childhood kind of situations and our feelings and all of those things also make up our internal dialogue as well. So the moon and Mercury both have a lot of overlap while the moon is more subjective in its experience of our thoughts and our perception of our reality. The third house ruler, so the third house has a lot to do with our mind. And so the planet that rules the third house, let's say I have Leo in my third house cusp, that means the sun is the ruler for my third house, as well as the ascendant ruler, which the ascendant is our, our approach to life, kind of how our past has colored our life and our decisions, our energy and sort of our personality. So that's the ascendant. So anything on the ascendant or the ascendant ruler is going to really show kind of what, um, if we tend to be a little bit more heady, for example, if it's an air sign, or if it's, you know, in a water sign, if we tend to be more emotional, those things will all become apparent with that ruler and any aspects of the ruler, of course. Mercury ruled signs, so Gemini and Virgo are extremely heady in nature, so the quality of these planets um, or the, or how many planets are in these signs will indicate if you tend to be on the analytical side as well as other air signs like Libra and Aquarius and then any planets and in, in the quality of the house the first house the third house the eighth house and the sixth and the twelfth house axis so I've noticed that the first house kind of like I was mentioning with the ascendant has to do with our energy our personality our approach to life the third house is our daily thoughts the way that we communicate about things as well which reinforces those thoughts the eighth house is where I believe we store our childhood and past traumas and so if you have some challenging planets here then or air signs here then one of the ways that you may store and react to the trauma is through you know certain effects on the brain and then the sixth and the twelfth house axis have a lot to do with psychosomatic illnesses, mental illness, the, the 12th house is sort of the repressed repressed version of ourselves, the 6th house can have a lot to do with anxiety in general, and so if I see some things going on there, then I know, you know, how good or how difficult the quality of my mind could be. So all of these elements combined together are going to start to give me an idea of what a client might be going through when reacting to certain experiences. And it's important to look at the chart as a whole. So there's a lot of factors to consider. And many of us are going to have a number of these. So it's important to look at the entire chart as a whole. It's important to, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's important to look for patterns and to realize that it's always on a scale. If we don't have, if we have a, a, a number of these, we might just be a normal person. And if we have a lot of these and these consistent patterns appearing or um, some more of the intense kind of qualities that I'm about to go over, then we will start to see where it may actually inhibit you in some ways and be less functional um, in certain ways. So when we're looking at you know, planets and signs that can affect the mind or archetypes that can affect the mind, um, we really are going to focus a lot on Uranus, Mars, Neptune, Saturn, and Pluto. And then, of course, again, looking at Mercury-ruled signs can show us further archetypes as well. So Uranus and Mars have the property of stimulation. So when in a kind of hard aspect, which we're going to get to in a second, they can bring about a lot of anxiety, um, hyperactivity in the mind, overstimulation, worrying about the future. They tend to make you feel a lot of electricity, a lot of energy. This is going to be the people who are tapping their foot, the people who are super busy or at the very least have very, very busy minds, who talk very quickly, who think very quickly. So it feels harder for them to slow down, to calm their nervous system, to shut down um, and to just relax. And so you'll start to notice 
individuals with this will tend to be prone to more of the mania side of anxiety um, or mind kind of matters rather than the depressive side. We also have Neptune, which um, has its whole host of issues on its own. Um, so Neptune is a very psychic and porous planet when in contact with the moon or with our Mercury, it can give us feelings of being overly receptive to our environment. So this can make us hypersensitive because we don't necessarily have a membrane that can protect us from what's outside. It's like as if we didn't have skin and we walked around with air touching our muscles and things being able to get into our bodies. It's, it's, a, it's a vulnerable state and it can lead to overwhelm. It can lead to fear of experiencing enlarged emotions or having enlarged reactions. You can start to imagine negative future scenarios because it's a very imaginative planet. You can be indecisive or confused or paranoid because of the way that it can sort of skew reality. Um, and if it doesn't skew reality and make you see things that maybe aren't there or make you see things from a different perspective, it it can at the very least make you feel things very deeply and feel things to the point where they haven't even happened yet, but you've lived them. And so Neptune can be um, very common in people who are highly sensitive individuals and who have their own level or different type of anxiety than the Uranus and Mars. With Saturn, we tend to see the more depressive side of the mind where we think more pessimistically, we feel like we are not part of a whole, we feel more detached. So we don't feel, we tend to feel isolated, we don't feel included oftentimes, or we will take ourselves out um, and kind of deactivate from our environment, from the things that we enjoy, um, that sort of thing. And it can also make us overly focused on the past and kind of just feeling like there is this gray sort of coloring to life or like reality is a harsh reality. We have to survive. We have to endure. Um, and it can make it can kind of harden us in some ways and make us unable to express emotion. So I am there's often a fear of vulnerability, um, a fear of diving into the feelings. And there's a suppression of those feelings, which is usually how the depression can um, or the melancholy can arise because the feeling body has been so kind of subdued that it becomes, um, you know, like it doesn't really know how to function properly. Pluto can be linked with more so fear. So this is paranoia, you know, kind of feeling like people maybe are out to get you or like, you know, someone is going to betray you or you can't trust people. Um, and this can attract oftentimes being taken advantage of, which can reaffirm the, these kinds of belief systems. Um, or maybe it's often usually because there was some sort of loss of control um, in childhood where one was taken advantage of or one was controlled in some capacity. And, and then there, stem, there is a huge fear around being controlled after that, which can lead to that kind of paranoia and mistrust of individuals. It can also lead to obsession and looping where you have trouble kind of letting go of a certain thought or certain feeling um, and you just feed into it over and over again, um, having trouble almost like getting past whatever it is that you are thinking about. And then the energy of Mercury World signs have t two distinct qualities to them that I wanted to differentiate. Virgo tends to be the over analysis paralysis. This is usually coming from perfectionism of being too zoomed in on the details of, you know, how everything is done that you can't take a step back and have the broader perspective of why you're doing what you're doing. And if that even matters, um, there can be just too much anxiety because of being the, the fact of being self-critical. Whereas Gemini tends to have more of that Uranus Mars kind of energy where you can overthink things, you can have a hyperactive mind, you can be overstimulated, always looking for kind of new information, wanting more and more stimulation, which can lead to, again, the motors just like churning very, very quickly within the mind, um, which can also lead to indecision as well because there can be so much data overload. So they do tend to have a different 
kind of energy or focus. And so these are the general archetypes that can affect the mind. So for example, we're going to get into this in the next slide. But if you see somebody with Uranus or Mars squaring their moon or squaring their Mercury, you notice that you're going to notice that they're going to have maybe overstimulation or anxiety. Um, and especially if that moon is in, Mer in Gemini, right, they're going to have excessive hyperactive energy within the mind. Or if the moon is conjunct Saturn, you're going to notice that it's going to be a little bit more melancholic. So you can kind of see the archetypes that affect the mind play out in that way. So here are the mind maladies, as I call them. So we want to first look at the condition of the moon and Mercury. These are going to be the primary focus. And then there are going to be other things on the right hand side that we also are going to consider. So we're going to look at everything, but especially the condition of the moon and Mercury. So are, Mook, are the moon and Mercury in fall or detriment, aka are they in signs that they do not feel comfortable in? So that would be Mercury in Sagittarius or Pisces, the moon in Capricorn or Scorpio. This is going to give them less tools to balance themselves out. This is going to make them more inconsistent and just have them um, be less functional and able to handle kind of the rest of what it could come at them. So if it's just your Mercury is in Pisces, that's not going to say that, oh, you're going to have, you know, anxiety. It's, it's not saying that at all. But if your Mercury is in Pisces and then it has a square to Uranus and Mars, that Mercury in Pisces is less able to handle this energy um, and bounce back from it because of the fact that it's in a sign it doesn't feel comfortable. And it's like you having to run a marathon in really tight clothes. It's like if you're wearing really tight clothes and you're just hanging around, you're probably fine. But if you're trying to run a marathon, you're probably not fine. So there's something about that that's important. And again, we're looking for patterns. We're looking for multiplication of things. And again, this is all on a scale. So maybe you have just like a normal functioning mind that sometimes you experience anxiety over normal things to experience anxiety from. And then sometimes it takes over because maybe you have more of these things. So you'll start to see kind of where you fall. Do you have a lot of planets in Gemini or Virgo, those Mercury ruled signs or the other air signs, Libra and Aquarius? Do you have difficult planets in the sixth, eighth or 12th houses or moon and Mercury in these signs or in these houses? Do you have aspects from Mercury and the moon to Mars and Saturn? This is any aspects, but especially hard aspects will be the more prevalent or the more um, difficult ones. Do you have hard aspects, including the conjunction to Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto from your moon and Mercury? And is your moon in a hard aspect to Mercury? So moon opposite Mercury is something I see very commonly in people who struggle with feeling a lot um, and, and struggling to kind of manage their mind and emotions. It's like their mind and their emotions are at odds with each other and they kind of swing back and forth into extremes. And we're going to show some examples of that. So all of these are things, again, to look out for. Is your moon or Mercury in detriment or fall? Is it in an air or a Virgo sign? Is it in the 6th, 8th, and 12th houses? Are there aspects to Mars, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto? Especially hard aspects. And are they an aspect to each other? Lastly, we want to look at other things. Like are Mars or Saturn in air signs? Are they in the 12th house? The 12th house is a particularly difficult house associated again with kind of mental undoing in many cases. And so if you see a malefic, a challenging, difficult plant like Mars or Saturn there, especially in an air sign, you'll start to notice that the mind can self-sabotage you. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, are they on an angle? Are they conjunct the ascendant? Are they on the IC? Or are these planets also in the, the 6th, 8th, or 12th house? Chiron in an aspect to the moon, Mercury, or the ruler of the third house. So Chiron is a planet associated with wounding and pain. So anything going on, especially with the moon and Mercury, is going to make it very obvious that there is something that you are having to struggle through in regards to your mental or emotional well-being. You also want to look at the ascendant ruler and third house ruler as we mentioned before, to see the condition of it, to see the, the signs. Is it in an air sign? Is it in the 6th, 8th, or 12th house? Is it in hard aspect to any of those plants I mentioned? 
So you're still using the same criteria, but looking at the ascendant ruler, third house ruler. So essentially this is all kind of going in order of importance with the last one being maybe the least important. And we want to look um, at all of these to consider the larger picture of what's going on. So just an FYI, as I've mentioned, everyone will have our number of, a number of these challenges in our chart and they're basically just an indicator that the more you have, the more attention and more care you may have to put into your mental health and well-being. You can always improve your mental health with the help of a psychologist and, and they are the only ones that can really diagnose or kind of look at the severity of what someone is actually struggling with. In astrology, we cannot see the severity of something. We cannot see what work they've done. We can only see predispositions. And it's important to notice that predispositions are not predetermined experiences. So just because somebody has a predisposition in their family doesn't mean it's ever going to turn on, doesn't mean it's ever going to happen for them. But in astrology, we can see that there is a potential there at times. We go through transits that will worsen or better our mental health experiences as well. So we can do our best to cope with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's likely that some of them will be triggered for healing and uh, or for improvement or for the worse during different periods of our life, depending on the challenge of the transit. And again, you are not ang anxious. You experience anxiety instead of defining yourself by it. Okay. So let's take a look at my father's chart first. So we can see his moon is in Virgo, which is a Mercury ruled sign. And the moon is also conjunct the North Node, which is not something I totally mentioned, but in astrology, you're always going to have unlimited number of factors to look at. So there's going to be, I did mention the most important things to look at, but there's going to be other things that I haven't talked about that you can also examine to see somebody's, you know, contribution to their well-being mentally or not. The North Node is another one of those things. So the North Node on the moon is going to make someone kind of like Moon Neptune hypersensitive. It's going to make their emotions a lot bigger and sometimes it can make them a little bit harder to manage. This is something that they're meant to in this lifetime learn how to harness and emotionally regulate. So his moon is already in a very self-critical sign and it's this issue is kind of exacerbated by the North Node being there emphasizing this energy even more. On top of this, it's directly and exactly opposite Mercury and its fall in Pisces. So as I mentioned, Mercury and its fall is already going to be struggling. And then moon opposite Mercury is one of the ones I see in particular with those who oftentimes can have mood swings or struggle between their heart and their mind or who feel really, really big um, and can this can oftentimes kind of influence their thinking to become more subjective or emotionally colored, which can kind of affect relationships, which creates this vicious cycle. Um, so you'll notice that this happens a lot with Mercury opposite the moon, especially when they're in the first of all, Mercury is in fall and then the moon is in a Mercury ruled sign. So there's a lot going on here. And the south node as well n next to Mercury is going to um, weaken this as a planet. So Mercury is weakened by being in fall and the south node is an energy suck that will weaken a planet. So that's another weakening factor. Um, on top of this, he has his moon making a trine to Saturn and um, Saturn also squaring the sun, which I didn't really cover, but Saturn squaring the sun can sometimes make you feel like life is hard or life is against you. Um, and then even though it's in a positive trine with the moon, Saturn with the moon in general can lead to that kind of depressive or dampening of the emotion. So not only does he feel in a big way and has a lot of signs or planets in Pisces, which can be quite sensitive, um, but he has trouble regulating between his logical mind and his emotional body. And then he may uh, struggle with being a little bit more depressive with that trine with Saturn. On top of this, this is where I think the suicide factor came in. He has Mercury, I'm uh, sorry, he has Mars and Chiron conjunct. So not only does he have kind of the difficulty in the mental and emotional faculties that are he's predisposed to, but on top of this, there is that the sometimes self-sabotaging aspect that I can see with Mars and Pluto, especially with Mars and Chiron conjunct, um, which can lead to 
difficulty with confidence. Um, a lot, again, this can make one like very sensitive as well. And it's opposite Pluto, which I think this whole combination in general can make one feel powerless or can make one feel like powerless to themselves, to their addictions, um, to their problems, make you highly sensitive. It's also very classic with Mars and Pluto opposition or squares to kind of suppress anger and what happens to things that are bottled up inside of us is they can turn against us, which I mentioned in my 12th house video. So definitely check that out. And so those things kind of result in the self-sabotage, which can, could have, you know, indicated his suicide. Um, okay. Next we have Marilyn Monroe. And it's funny because I was looking at her chart and kind of writing notes about it. And some of the words that came up were rejection and um, projection as well. And those two quotes appeared immediately in like one of the first articles I read. So she says, I could tell you all about rejection. Sometimes I feel my whole life has been one big rejection. So we can see that this is a common emotional theme and we'll talk about why. And then she also says, I never wanted to be Marilyn. It just happened. Marilyn's like a veil I wear over her real name, Norma Jean. So she played a role. You know, she was projecting or projected upon by society and not actually embodying her real self. And we can see that also in her chart. So first of all, we can see that her ascendant ruler, her ascendant is Leo. So her ascendant ruler is the sun, which is Gemini. So not only is her sun in Gemini, but her ascendant ruler is also Gemini. Her Mercury is in Gemini. So she's got a lot of like headiness already here. She's got a lot of a busy mind. You know, she might be quite astute, but she's, she's thinking. She's thinking quite often. On top of this, she has a T-square going on, which is the moon and, and Neptune opposite each other. The moon is also in an air sign in Aquarius. And as we mentioned, Neptune can lead to that hypersensitivity. It can also lead to lead to like dissociation from reality. Um, the moon is considered the public in astrology. So the public opinion, the public people. So the moon... Neptune is indicating the, the public saw what they wanted to see with her. And then the moon is also our internal emotions. So she as well may have felt like dissociated from herself because she was playing into that role that people saw within her. So this is also um, going to bring about this moon Neptune opposition is going to bring about the possibility to be again, hypersensitive, confused, paranoid, um, you can be prone to over idealizing situations. So seeing things as much better than they are and then feeling deflated when they don't result in what you wanted them to be. You can lie to yourself. Um, again, projection, all of these things, deception are very common with Neptune. You, one of the biggest things here is feeling misunderstood. So feeling like you can't be yourself or when you are yourself, people don't get you. And again, feeling rejected. Those are very common themes here with moon Neptune. You can feel rejected, misunderstood, especially in a hard aspect like an opposition or a square. It's not going to be true for everyone. Um, I have my moon with Uranus and Neptune and I don't really feel rejected. Um, but that's a whole other thing. You can feel taken advantage of. The Neptune is very common in victimhood. And so we're going to actually see this in another area of her chart where she actually has this theme of being a victim. Um, and unfortunately, moon Neptune can also not only make like other areas of her chart made her a victim. And then moon Neptune can also kind of feed this narrative of I'm a victim. I'm a victim. Um, it can lead you to feeling like a martyr, like having to sacrifice yourself for some maybe bigger ideal or for somebody else in your life and be taken advantage of. The On top of this, so not only was she having that that kind of intense emotional experience, but on top of this, it's make, they're both making a square to Saturn, which is this depressive episode. It's in the fourth house as well, which is leading to her feeling like she can't um, own her own feelings or express her own vulnerability. And this is coming from, you know, difficulty in the childhood home, feeling like you weren't supported. Um, I think that she... I cannot remember her full story, but I think that she was like in a foster home or something. So there, there's obviously, there is a lot of trauma and pain and rejection already being experienced within um, these squares to Saturn in the fourth house and feeling like I can't be vulnerable with people because I can't trust that they're not going to leave me. I can't trust that they're not going to abandon me. 
Um, and then that can also sometimes lead to really pushing down your own emotions as well and leading to a lack of confidence and having a lot of fear that can come up around this. So she's having a huge kind of internal dialogue going on that people can't see on the surface because they see what she wants them to see. On top of this, one of the hardest parts of her chart is the fact that she has Uranus and Mars conjunct in the eighth house. So, and they're in Pisces, which doesn't have to be bad, but oftentimes Pisces can be linked to Neptune and victimhood and that whole thing. And then on top of this, the eighth house has a lot to do with our childhood trauma, as I mentioned. So, and and on top of that, they are also making a trine to Saturn in the fourth, which is linking this idea to childhood trauma um, and, and not being able to express oneself, not being able to trust others. The Uranus Mars in the eighth house can make her feel really flighty. It can make her feel unsafe, like life is predictable, like she can't sink in and relax and feel comfortable in life, like she needs to be hyper vigilant because anytime somebody could hurt her or the other shoe could drop. Um, and it's also the reason why she was so sexualized. But on top of this, she did experience um, childhood sexual abuse. So this is indicated actually with Mars in the eighth house. That's not always the case, but um, in her particular chart, it was. And then she does have her moon loosely conjunct Jupiter, which is going to help her, especially in achieving fame and help her be, you know, liked through relationships because it's in the seventh house and will help her feel optimistic at times and expansive at times and reach for more and not just kind of collapse under all of this mental turmoil. Um, but ultimately, it wasn't enough with all of these other harsh indicators in her chart. Okay, Amber Heard. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the infamous case with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard already. And in this case, Depp's forensic psychologist claimed that Amber, um, in her psychological tests, her responses were consistent with borderline personality disorder. I'm not diagnosing her. I don't know. But given the audio material, given all the evidence, it is very possible that this is something that she struggles with. And BPD... Borderline personality disorder often results in unpredictable mood swings, fear of being abandoned, impulsivity, self-destructive, and destructive behavior towards others. So we all probably have that in small doses, and I think BPD is where you kind of have that in larger doses. So why that? Why might that be the case? Well, first of all, we can see that her moon is in an air sign, it's in Libra, and it's opposite Mercury and Aries. So we're seeing already again this kind of element here of Moon-Mercury oppositions being quite challenging. Her Mercury in Aries can be a little bit fiery or combative, um, which can then lead to maybe more fights or more relationship trouble, bigger emotions. Um, and then she has, again, just competing needs between her desire for relationships and to be liked and this other side of her that wants to be right. And both of these planets are making a square to Neptune and Mars in the sixth house. So first of all, or actually, let me back up a little bit because the moon is in the third house. As I mentioned, the third house is very important for our quality of our mind. So the moon being here is representing with this opposition that it's even more so going to affect her mental state and her everyday thinking and communicating. On top of this, again, they're both squaring Mars and Neptune in the sixth house which is also, again, a difficult house for anxiety. And especially Mars is also already kind of an anxious planet. Even though it's quite strong in the sign of Capricorn, the fact that it is making these squares to the moon and to Mercury, and then with Neptune being involved there, weakening Mars, it's going to make her, um, it's going to weaken her mental state. It's going to make her more prone to anxiety to anger in particular, to like angry outbursts. Um, with Neptune there, it's going to make her more paranoid and alter her perception of reality. So those can kind of feed into each other. Her Since they're together, her altered perception of reality can make her angrier. Um, and the sixth house in particular is where we feel less than or we, are, we have to feel like we have to work hard to prove ourselves. So there's this underlying feeling of I'm not good enough that we often have to work through with our sixth house. So if, if we haven't really worked through that yet, that can help stimulate this cycle already that's appearing here with Mars and Neptune, where 
um, she's feeling like she maybe has insecurities and anxiety and has to prove herself. And then she maybe sees things that aren't there, sees things in a different way where she maybe takes certain things as insults and then blows up because of this square with the moon um, and Mercury and those being in opposition. And that, again, feeds the cycle. So it, it, it's quite difficult. Her son is also her ascendant ruler. So Leo ascendant, son um, in Taurus. Unfortunately, her son is opposite Pluto. This is very common in people who grow up with a very um, dominant parental figure, oftentimes the father, and can sometimes indicate a father that is maybe somewhat emotionally, physically, or alcoholically abusive. Um, that's not always going to be the case, but that can be the case with this. Or there's some kind of like controlling element of childhood. But that's exactly what happened with her. Her father was abusive and an alcoholic. And so this can also inform her personality because that's what the sun is. And so it can create this um, this feeling of like, of being, I don't want to be controlled. And then also I don't, that paranoia of this. So um, she needs to be the one to hold the power. She needs to be the one um, to maybe manipulate and kind of get what she wants because of how she's been maybe controlled or abused during her childhood as well. So she has this mix between hard aspects with Neptune and Pluto, which can again create this paranoia, paranoia and altering her perception of reality, which can feed into each other to create a toxic cycle. And then that Mars, um, that square with Mars and then the Mercury moon opposition can create these big mood swings, anxiety, anger, um, and all these things kind of feeding into the potential of having a BPD diagnosis. Okay, Halsey, we're going to do this one. And then I think after this, we have my remedies or how I've personally dealt with some of these experiences. So Halsey has opened up about being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So this is something she has claimed that she's had. I saw some sources online say BPD, which is something different. So I'm kind of confused, but it seemed like the more unanimous one was bipolar. So she has a very strong moon. Her moon is in the sign of cancer. It's in the ninth house. So you this is going to help her a little bit. This is going to help her process and feel her emotions, maybe sometimes in a bigger way. Um, but the moon is just more comfortable allowing herself to feel in this sign. So that's a good thing for her. And the ninth house can bring that sense of hope that I'm going to gain something out of this experience. Um, it's not just suffering, right? Where the moon starts to go downhill is the fact that it's being really kind of tortured by the conjunction with Mars and the opposition with Uranus and Neptune. The conjunction with Mars is going to lead to a lot of anxiety and overstimulation, just like the Uranus opposition, which is the mania aspect of bipolar. So we can definitely see that here. And then Neptune is going to add in this kind of creative element, which is really good for her um, career. I know that she mentioned that she actually uses this period of time for like this overstimulated period of time for creating music. And she said that it's very um, like useful for her when she is in this kind of state, but it is going to, so while it can manifest as kind of creativity and all that, it can also manifest as feeling really, really big emotions and becoming anxious or overwhelmed as a result of them. Um, and again, kind of experiencing that type of manic state where you might go down a rabbit hole over worrying, over processing about a certain situation that affected you emotionally that you might be more sensitive to because Neptune is there. Um, and because also Uranus and Neptune on top of this are in the third house of the mind. So this is going to, again, add to this kind of volatility in her mindset and hypersensitivity in her mindset. The Probably one of the best reasons why her energy is not just dissipated is not only because Neptune can help you channel creatively and so can Uranus, but also because her moon is making a really strong, her moon and Mars are making a strong trine to Pluto in the first house, which can be linked with kind of intense focus and obsession. And because it's a trine, it's going to have less of those negative consequences is going to result in her having a little bit more to gain out of that experience. And so that's why I think that her main, you know, maybe manic episodes or her hyperactivity, moments of hyperactivity are able to focus into her work with that Pluto trine um, to create something out of that, to 
transmute those emotions and that energy into something really powerful for her life. Um, and I think that can be very regenerative and healing for her. She may also experience kind of depressive episodes with her Mercury in the 12th house. So this is one where, again, we can kind of have sometimes self undoing with the planets that are in the 12th house. We can have some of that. Um, we can just, those planets tend to, to be more likely to struggle with, with mental issues. On top of that, it's making a trine to Saturn in her fourth house. Saturn in the fourth house um, is already kind of difficult for expressing yourself emotionally. And then because it's trining her Mercury, that can kind of lead to that feeling of being a little bit more depressive. Mercury is also squaring Mars, which can relate to that ang anxious feeling. Um, or it's just, it's another malefic. So it's going to give her uh, a harder time really feeling her best and in the 12th house she may with her mercury in the 12th and her saturn in the fourth she may really self-isolate which can also worsen the problem and the fact that's in the sign of scorpio maybe can make you it's a fixed sign it can maybe make you brood or kind of hold on to something a little bit longer than it would benefit her saturn is also the ruler of her third house so that just kind of emphasizes how all this is going to affect her mentally so here is how i say to work with your mind obviously go to a therapist everything i mentioned i'm not a doctor um, but these are just some things that can be helpful depending on the planet and then i have some specific exercises for you that i use so mars really great for physical exercise outlets massage yoga to kind of get the energy out of your body or out of your mind and into your body if you're a quiet headache person your mars maybe needs to be activated saturn is really great because it does tend to leave to more kind of pessimistic attitudes so gratitude exercises to help you focus on cultivating more of that feeling of appreciation of looking at the good things looking at the glass half full expressing yourself emotionally so if you feel something come up letting it out so it doesn't get pushed down and, and again become depressive or movement because that always kind of gets people's um you know good hormones flowing so that can help with some of that negativity Uranus is so electrical, so it really needs to be grounded. So it feels quite chaotic. And so sometimes the best way to do this is by either creating something, like making something with your hands or writing something, like channeling the energy into an object that you're working on or working with, um, or literally grounding your feet, like taking off your shoes, walking around outside, touching trees, going on hikes, um, not trying to overstimulate yourself physically but to try to calm yourself with natural resources around you as well as epsom salt baths and neptune in particular is really great for water if you feel very emotionally overwhelmed this is what i do i take showers i go in the hot tub i take a bath i go in the ocean whatever body of water or type of water is near me is extremely helpful even to just be near water helps you emotionally regulate um, sleep, so like dreams, dream work, um, being very aware of what's going on in your dreams and kind of the symbols and what, you know, the universe is trying to help you process is going to be very helpful. Neptune is a very artistic planet, so listening to music can really transform you, can really move you. If you flow with the music, maybe do yoga with the music, um, it's just one of the best ways to channel this energy. Nature as well, nature is probably always going to be good. Um, aromatherapy, so activating other type of senses, like not just not just listening, but maybe smelling or feeling, um, spiritual tools, any kind of spiritual tools, and also meditation. Um, you know, consistent meditation would be very helpful. Lastly, Pluto is more about our shadow side. So it's about uncovering what has been buried. It's about facing our fears so that they don't grow into something that becomes obsessive or that controls us through our mind. So that looks like therapy. Um, again, meditation is going to work great for something like this. Shadow work, inner child work, anything where you're basically addressing fears head on and trying to transmute them into something positive in your life. Lastly, here are some anxiety hacks that I personally came up with um, that I actually just journaled about last night and I was like, I kind of wanted to share these with you guys and it happened to play out with this particular episode of on, on YouTube. So 
I am really guilty of negative forecasting. So kind of playing out future events and worrying about them extensively. So here are some things that I have found that work for me. First is maybe not going to work for everyone. So just try it. And if it doesn't work and it makes it worse, please don't do it again. The first one is to imagine the whole scenario play out and imagine the outcome. So we tend to worry about the negative thing happening and we get caught in the worrying of it, but we don't actually play out the whole scenario of what would that actually be like and how would I deal with it? Because oftentimes it might not be quite as bad. So for example, you may be really worried about not getting the job, but then asking yourself, okay, let's say I don't get the job, then what happens? You know, how am I gonna handle that? What would I do instead? Is my life gonna be really affected that much in five, 10, 15 years? It can help you to not only play out the scenario, but then compare it to the future and see like, will this really matter in the long run? Can I handle this emotionally? Have I handled something similar to this in the past? Emotionally, can I provide evidence for myself as to all the reasons why I would be able to handle something like this? The second is to repeat the mantra that I'm playing out a potential future scenario that is not happening and may never happen. So sometimes with Neptune especially, you can get really caught up in this version of reality in your head that you feel like is happening, but you have to remind yourself that it's not. Lastly, you can also reason with yourself and tell yourself, I'm already invested in a negative storyline. So I've already thought about all the bad stuff that can happen. Now let's see what I can do. Now let's see what can go right. My brain has already covered that. Now let's see what could possibly happen that's good. How can I ensure my success? And then very lastly, remind yourself that the past does not predict the future. Remind yourself of all the times that you have actually overcome past circumstances and improved your life and it stayed that way.